from the Tie Cats Audio Network. This is Tie Cats Today with Steve Milton. It's Tuesday, June 18th. This is Tie Cats Today, and I'm Steve Milton. Well, they played Sunday, and they don't play again until next Sunday night, so the Tiger Cats aren't practicing today. In fact, they're completely off, and we'll be back at Tim Hortons Field tomorrow morning to get ready for the return match against the Rough Riders in Saskatchewan. Now, there will be some situations this year in which they'll have what's called a day zero on a day like today, when Scott Milanovic feels they need extra work, and sometimes it would be a meeting day. But after a long training camp, two weeks of team practice, and another long flight this weekend, in my mind, the rest and the recoup was a really good move. Still, there were several players at the donut box today, box today. some of them uh, injured guys uh, getting treatment, and a couple of guys were on the practice roster out there just doing some drills on the field on their own, and others on the regular roster were here to do their own off-field conditioning routines. But that downtime from the players just gives me a little more time, welcome time indeed, with my colleague and longtime friend John Salavantis, Coach Sal, who's going to join us every Tuesday on Ticats today to give us his experienced and very incisive takes on what transpired the weekend before and anything else that strikes us as relevant in the universe of the Ticats and the CFL. Coach Sal is an absolute fixture around this franchise. He was an assistant coach with the black and gold, very important assistant coach, assistant coach too, from 1985 to 1990. Then he was back again from 1994 to 97, and then again in 2006. And in between, he's been the longtime analyst uh, on over-the-air radio, and he's been with the Ticats t- audio network as an analyst since its inception. We're going to look deeply into game two, the home opener, that wrenching, 33-30 lost to Saskatchewan on Sunday night. We watch most of the game within a few feet of each other in our press box perch high above the field like we've done so often for so many years. Hey, Sal. Welcome to Ticats today, and I'm so glad to be here with you. What did you see in the game on the weekend? Well, you know, Steve, I, I think the team started with some great energy, uh, right. which is expected at a home game uh, with the home crowd that we had. Uh, they didn't bring that same energy back in the second half, uh, and that was part of the downfall. But I really saw a lot of positives uh, okay. in the game, Steve. All right, let's start with uh, that. And even though that I, I think a lot of fans came away feeling negative because of the way it ended, uh, I think there were a lot of positives that may be obscured, at least for the moment, by by the uh, uh, heartbreaking ending, really, if you happen to be a Ticat fan. So what are, what are the, some of the positives you saw? Well, you know, you and I have watched a lot of games yeah, together. And, sure. uh, you know, we look at it differently at times. But my positive, number one, if you put up 30 offensive points, you should win the game. should win the game. Uh, but still, you need contributions from your special teams uh, in terms of uh, providing field position. And you need some help from your defense and some takeaways, which will give you added possessions in the game. But I thought it was really positive the way they came out. They put a long drive together. They didn't get the touchdown. And and that brings you to the red zone where you've got to, you know, be better in the red zone. But they put up three points off of that. I I thought that was that was a good positive. Do you think that's why they went for the three points there? I mean, obviously, they, you know, they, uh, you know, some people might say, well, you're already down there. You might as well try for the touchdown if you don't get it. You always always take take the the points when you can. Right. Especially. Uh, given that that quite often these games can can be close and and you know this might even be a team you end up going against on a crossover who knows uh, it's a long way early to think of that but but uh, what the uh, they actually only got to the red zone I think twice I think they were two for two uh, uh, ten points in the red zone uh, once in uh, I mean and that could be you know I mean that's deceptive because a, a lot of the, they had two, a couple of big, big plays for touchdown. They don't show on the red zone thing because you don't need to be in the red zone because you just scored. Yeah. And I, I think that goes back to uh, Mitchell playing uh, so well, yeah. uh, you know, his ability to slide around in the pocket and, and to keep his eyes downfield uh, and produce those big plays. Right. And that big play potential is always there. Uh, you know, I, I thought uh, you're not going to get much better than 380 yards passing uh, in a ball game. So, you know, I thought Mitchell did a good job in that area. The uh, It's funny, I think, because Scott Milanovic, I think it's, uh, Bo had said this after the game that, that Scott came up and said, you know, I think, you know, we, we want to get 400 and they got the 380 and had they got the 400, if those 20 years spread out the right thing, including maybe on one of the last couple of drives, if they'd got the 400, 
they win the game because you you would you would have eaten up some time there. Yeah, and if if we'd have caught the ball on the end zone uh, when it was right in the hands of the receiver, uh, you know that would have made a huge difference in the ball game. But yeah. he took advantage of of the breakdowns that Sask had when they had a breakdown in the secondary. He took advantage of it, and that was because he was able to move around in the pocket, keep his eyes downfield, and make the accurate throws. You used to you used to praise there, Sal, uh, uh, moving around in the pocket. Now. I realized that Bo was hurt twice last year. Uh, but, you know, he himself has said, you know, he had a couple of years where he wasn't the kind of quarterback that he wanted to be. He humbles you a little bit. He changed his body. Uh, it's pretty clear to those of us that know him, that would include you, um, that his body looks different there the, with all the work he's been doing with the strength and, and uh, uh, conditioning coordinator. Do you think, like, this isn't what we saw from him last year, that ability to move around that back there was it uh, or, or maybe i'm wrong maybe i missed something last year no you didn't miss anything you know i he's always been a guy that could stand in the pocket and make the throws uh, that goes back to you know if you've got a great offensive line in front of you uh, and you can get the ball out quick you can you can do that but at the same time you know he showed us in the first ball game against calgary that he's willing to run the ball now that makes a defense for their opponent uh, play a little differently, and Sask had to play him a little differently. But uh, I like the way he's playing. I, I think you know you can't ever say last year was was uh, a bad year. Last year just you almost have to erase it. It, it was it a write off year for him. Mitchell. Yeah. yeah, it was not a Bo Mitchell type year. And I think people have to recognize that uh, this guy's an elite quarterback, and he continues to be that. Games come down to trenches and quarterbacks, right? I mean, that's essentially it, especially a two game, two down game like ours. And I realize special teams are a, a massive part of all of this as as well, as you so correctly pointed out. But when you 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 said one of the things you said, if he gets the time, you know, sorry, if the line blocks well in front, that that's your I mean, you have a lot of areas of expertise, Sal, but that that was your number one one in my experience is is offensive line. What 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 did you what are you seeing from the offensive line? Well, I, I think the offensive line progressed from the Calgary game to this game exceptionally well. I think they they played well in this ball game. Now, Butler was shut down on the run game. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it really the run game wasn't as, as expected. But at the same time, that opens up that little play action pass. It opens up uh, an area that where uh uh, you know, you, you've got uh, Bo, as we said, able to move around in the pocket. We've got two tackles now that will grow with this team. The interior three are are, are really good football players. And, and let's stop there solid. for a moment and just remind people who the, those interior three are. That'd be David Beard at the center and the two yeah, guards. Yeah, we're talking about Revenberg and Beard and, yeah. and Wood Manzi. And Wood Manzi, yeah. And he's a good young player. Eh? He's really uh, he he's come playing with way. more a little more confidence right now too. a little more outgoing as well. And, 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 you know, and, and got a little belligerence to him as well. Yeah. I'd, I'd like the way uh, those guys are playing right now, you know, in the first ball game, I saw pressure from the inside where the defensive end was taking advantage of our left tackle and right. making an inside move. Okay. That didn't happen in this game. That mm. tells me that he's progressed. That right. He's, able to adjust to what the defense was trying to do. So uh, I like the way they're playing. As long as they can improve game in and game out, Butler will get his yards. He'll get his runs. Uh, that will come along. The Calgary game, they played a soft uh, defensive secondary, which allowed the run. Right. In the SAS game, those linebackers weren't allowing that run, and, and that showed. But that means the linebackers are up tight to the line of scrimmage, giving the receivers a lot of area in behind to make those throws. And Bo found them many, many times. And there's a couple of times, I'm sure there's a couple of throws he'd like back, a couple where he maybe his footwork weren't so good. What do you, I mean, one of the things that a line coach often has to work with is, is with what the quarterback does and where he positions himself. And uh, what about Bo's feet? I thought he looked pretty good there. That's what everybody was talking about. And I don't mean just running just sort of getting himself ready to throw. 
Yeah, and that's what we talk about, movement in the pocket, without getting out of the pocket. You yeah. know, we have certain quarterbacks who will come uh, under pressure, and the first thing they'll do is run. And what the, what the good quarterbacks will do is move away from that pressure, give their offensive lineman a chance to readjust and, and get that guy, and still keep his eyes downfield and make the throws. And I think that's what Bo's doing. And that all comes back to the conditioning you talked about. Right. You know, uh, at that age, uh, and I don't want to mention age because you and I are in those categories, but <laughs> at, at the age of that quarterback, that's important that he's able to move around in there. I thought it showed, and Bo said that, he said, sometimes you have to be humbled a little bit. You know, and he said I was. He said I didn't have a couple of years that that I that I wanted to, uh, and uh, that humbles you. And maybe you start listening more to what I mean, David always wanted him to to run a little more in his latter years. And 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 Bo, I mean, to his credit, I mean, you can't get a guy to be more self critical than him. And sort of self analytical, I think, is probably the the right word. And 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 he, he was saying that maybe he was just had a little bit too much pride uh, to 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 you know, do what he's doing. Dickinson asked him to do or challenged him to do what, what uh, exactly what, what uh, Scott Milanovic has challenged him to do, but he's doing it, trying it harder with Scott. And part of that was the change in the body. He said that part of that was just because, you know, he was getting older and he, he realized he hadn't had quite, he, you know, he had had a little more humility. He said, I think the, that was the word he used. He had, he had to be humbled a little bit. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, a positive in uh, yeah. his, his attitude towards things. But at the same time, uh, 10 years in Calgary, you know, uh, he was the king. Right. And and so, you know, when you go to a coach's meeting with a quarterback who's been around a Tom Brady, uh, you know, uh, type quarterback that uh, has his own opinion about what to do and how to do it. Uh, sometimes you get a little bit of a clash and the coach backs down a little bit. Uh, I think Scott uh, has used the right approach to him is we've got to get back to ways uh, of moving the ball and moving you is one of those ways. Yeah. The, the, uh, I, I really, I really am interested in see how this progress over the season you know what kind of packages he puts in and whether this, this thing, I mean, I'm assuming it's going to, it's going to continue as long as Bo stay he stays healthy. That you might even see uh, a, a larger progression. You should after after two games and beyond. Um, you mentioned the running game. I mean they 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 couldn't really establish uh, the Butler as you said for for a couple of reasons. One of which is the manner in which they were playing defense. But is the fact that they kept going at it, even though they couldn't go at it too much because they, you know, they surrendered the lead at one point there. Uh, do, do, is, and then they felt they needed to, you know, maybe put the ball in the air a little bit more. And as you said, were able to. The commitment to the run and the fact that he keeps talking about it. And I don't think it's an accident that he keeps talking about it in public because people listen to those kinds of things and they have to keep that aware. That a big thing to make sure you keep committing, keep committing, keep committing. They did last year. Uh, once he took over as offensive coordinator. I, I really think, uh, and we've talked about this before, you and I have. Yeah. If you don't run early in the ball game, late in the ball game, when you need to run and put the game away, you're unable to do it because you had not progressed in the early part of the game. you got to keep fighting the run. Right. Keep pushing it at them. Those offensive linemen love the fact that they can come off the ball and attack the defender rather than always have to retreat and accept, you know, the defender on the, on the uh, other side of the line of scrimmage. So you, you got to keep pushing that run. And when you got a guy like Butler who can stay in there and keep pounding and take the pounding, uh, you know, I think where, where it gets a little sticky is if you're always coming up on second down and long. Then you have to make some adjustments. Well, that comes back to making uh, your run game uh, in line with not only Butler, but using your your slot backs and your quick sweeps, et cetera, et cetera, that that uh, make it different for the defensive players. When I'm and I'm not sure about this, so is why I'm asking your technical expertise here. When you when you have a when you sort of are running the ball and you're running it to a power back like that. There's a, 
a lot of RPO, a lot, a lot of run, run pass option. Uh, and Bo said his tendency in the past was always to pull the ball back. That's what he'd wanted to do first when he was playing, even when he had great running backs, which he normally has had. He said with, with Butler and the way the system's working here now, he finds himself, you know, actually giving the ball off there. Do, do you think that that helps set up a few things like it? Uh, I'm wondering if it set up that razzle dazzle play. Uh, that one where they touched, I think four different guys touched the ball and flipped it out to one, back to the other, back to back to blow down all the way down downfield to 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 Smith. Does that set those kinds of things up? Yeah, it really does, and and that was a great trick play or a oh. great uh, execution of a trick play. But at the same time, I I don't think we're talking with Bo about really the RPO, okay, uh, the run pass option. I think what we're talking is actual play action. Play action where, more than RPO. Where, where you're faking the running back and holding the linebackers with that fake and then coming back and throwing the ball. I don't think we want to get into an option type game with Bo where he has to pull the ball and right. go outside, which is what the defense will force him to do uh if if that's the case. You know, they're not gonna they're not gonna let uh, uh the fullback or the running back carry the ball if they know Bo has to carry it. So the end crashes down uh, and takes away the running back, forcing Bo to run with the ball. Secondary contain comes up, and we're looking for a new quarterback. And the other thing, uh, if we can stick with that, and it's sort of it's sort of related. There's, there's kind of a, a bit of a relationship between uh, the running back, uh, you know, and using the running back and, all, all of those kinds of things. And the fact that, that Scott Milanovic has talked about this for some time, talked about it all, a lot during the wintertime. And one of the things he wants to commit to as well is, is more of a, uh, what you might call an NFL type tight end package. They, they have the hybrid thing where they'll use one of the Canadians. In this case, uh, it looks like uh, uh, James Tuck has become the guy on, on, on that one, maybe moved ahead of uh, a Felix on that to become the the back that, that can play fullback and then also move to tight end and and sometimes those similarities are things and I call that a hybrid tight end but the but the pure tight end where you can either split them a little bit or he can block and and they've been using Robinson a little bit in there but they haven't really got the ball out there out of that tight are you surprised at that yet that they haven't we haven't seen that kind of pass off that tight end situation that, that what I would call a classic NFL tight end situation I think they went into the training camp with the idea. But right. the injuries really uh, uh, made them change some of what they're doing. Right. And and really what they've gone to is uh, a fullback situation where uh, uh, Tuck has become right. a big part of that offense. Huge part. Yeah, that, that's similar to a tight end formation, basically. Right. And you saw in this past ball game where they had a tight end and a wing at the same time. And then mm -hmm. the wing would move or the tight yeah. end would, would adjust. Uh, I think with a tight end, you get so many different things you can do. And you mentioned like the NFL where you get the nasty split where he's not really just a foot off or two foot. He may be four feet off, but that's just enough to make that linebacker move or that defensive end move. And I think that's what we're uh, going to evolve towards uh, with the tight end formations. Yeah, especially if, you know, I mean, they're, that that's a big one they got there in Robinson that, you know, he shows some stuff too. And then they used them, but he was doing a lot of blo blocking. You know, he does a little bit of that roll block that I, you know, and I imagine that's related to, to his play in the, in the, uh, in the NFL. Well, the other what? thing about it, the other thing yeah. about a tight end formation, when you talk about the NFL, NFL plays a lot of two cover, right. with two safeties back. So the, the throwing lane is the middle. Right. And you can get your tight end into the middle very easily now. And he's got a size advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't see a lot of uh, cover two uh, in the CFL. Right. Right. If it is cover two, it has to be man under in order to make it work. Uh, it, it's, it's just the field is too big. So you can get the slot back or, uh, as we talked about, a tight end into that middle too easily. So we don't see a lot of that. Uh, we're going to see more. I think uh, of the cover three, cover four type plays. You are you uh, optimistic uh, about the way the team played? I mean, the set that let's take the second quarter for instance. They, I mean, they were dominant uh, on both sides of the ball uh, during that 
during that second quarter. I think they stopped them five out of six times on the on the drives. Uh, I think they had one touchdown early in the second quarter, but the, the, and and one long drive. But most of the time it was you know three, four, five plays. And oh, you fairly optimistic about? Just I'm very the overall? optimistic. I, I really am. Uh, I, I see the D line uh, very much improved. The front four guys uh, in that ball game, and one of the guys that, of course, Barrow got the sacks, but the unsung guy for me was Usher. Absolutely. I, I thought I Usher made more. things happen uh, out there that that allowed Barrow to make those make those sacks. But I, I think they've improved. Um, they shut the run down uh, against a very good back. Olet, we know from Toronto is a is a good solid back, uh, and they did a good job of shutting him down. One of the sacks, for example, one of the sacks that uh, D. N. Barlow uh, Barlow made just before halftime saved some points. Right, it did. That that sack saved some points. Now, as for the bad side of that. The roughing call on the quarterback at the end of the third quarter, that one cost them points. So, you yeah. know, it, it goes hand in hand. You, you've got to be smart enough to know uh, you can't tackle a quarterback low to start with uh, and, to, and that roughing cost them. But, I, again, I, I'm very encouraged at, at what I saw up front. I thought Hoyt coming in to play that Will linebacker uh, allowing Wilborn to uh, to move around a little bit, move into the middle, and and using Wilson Hoyt and and uh, uh, Wilburn in kind of in a combination of things uh, really was good. So I'm encouraged there. Where I, where I'm a little skeptical, and I know it'll take time, is in the secondary. Right. They have to really tighten up in the secondary. Peters come in for the first ball game, did a good job on that side. And but they went takes, at him three straight times, right? They they wanted to test him to see if his leg. They went right at him right away. Yeah. And he, and he, he he took the challenge and, took and the challenge. did a good job on it. But it, it takes time for the secondary to come together as a group. You've got a good free safety in Katzentonis. Yeah, a good free safety. He he is a hitter. Now he he may not be a Hitchcock yet, no. but he's the kind of a hitter that that the receivers will start paying attention to. Yeah, you so, know he's there. As long as these guys can stay on the field together, and we're talking about Lawson and Leonard and George and Peters, they will get better. They they will tighten up, and and they won't have the communication mistakes that that they uh, had in the last couple of ball games. That looked yeah. It, so you felt that was communication. That's what it looked like from where I was I was sitting sitting as well. And and I'm, you know, on the long. I, I, that's a your second and seven. There's no other way to say this, John. Second and seventeen after a great sack, basically set up by Usher to force him back in uh, to to where Barlow could could grab him, and the place is going nuts. Looks like they've got the game, and uh, what they were second and set, what they were at the fifteen yard line, yeah. second and seventeen, and they complete the pass. Like how does that happen? Well, you know, it, it goes it goes to uh, talking about what we're saying is is you got to tighten up in those areas. You got to understand down distance on on what's happening. You know the quarterback's going to get the ball out quick. Mm -hmm. You know who the potential hot receivers are going to be based on your defensive scheme. Right. But you have to be able to tighten down. We made the same mistake in the end zone when they scored one of the touchdowns where we had the halfback way too deep. Right. Uh, and and uh, he wasn't able uh, to make the play. He was expecting the linebacker to get underneath the throw that came on that little short post uh, inside. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, if he tightens down, that post is gone. The, right. That quarterback's not going to throw the ball in there. Well, we're going to end here in a second. The uh, And I don't want to end in a negative. I do... Uh, you know, I guess I, I want to. I think we have to point out there's a sense of deja vu to this, the, the in in the in the fourth quarter uh, that happened a lot last year, and of course that's what fans see. They don't know, they don't know even as much maybe as inside as as I do, and definitely not as much as you, and definitely not as much as the people on the field that goes on there. But is that a concern? 
that 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 uh, here is in the second half again they were outscored. Yeah, um, I just wonder. Yeah, I, I think you're didn't... right. You know, it, it's a mindset, right? And and when they go come out at halftime flat, it's tough to get momentum back. Momentum right. is a big part of the game, right. and when you lose momentum, it's hard to get that momentum back. And I think what we have to be able to do is the players have to take the responsibility. When they go in at halftime, the coaches have got work to do. They don't have time for rah-rah talks about let's get out there and get after them. You know, the Newt Rockney days are gone. No, they got a scheme. Yeah, they got a... they, they come in and they do their work and they make their adjustments. Saskatchewan in this game made the better adjustments at halftime than what Hamilton did. And that and the... falls back to the players. If the players come out with the same amount of energy they had in the first quarter, that would not have happened. So that but, responsibility is going to go to those guys who are the leaders on that team. And you, the, uh, well, you had the 99 team there. And if you talk to any of those 99 guys, they'll tell you that they had the responsibility. The, the coaches were just there uh, to put the salt lick out and let the cows run to it. They, that's right. They were not. They, they, they talked they, a lot about that. They themselves did it. Yeah, they talked a lot about this week. And, and, and they were of a very high degree of, you know, uh, of of accountability on that team you know they they right. basically square up against each other but you know two minutes later they'd be hugging and kissing right that that i mean that there was no doubt that it was done out of out of sort of care for each other and responsibility and and uh taking taking accountability but you know the, in the first game it was hamilton that that really actually made the the great adjustments on both sides of the ball uh, against calgary you know and had a chance to come back there and, and uh, i'm just uh Overall, then you would be. Where do you see the improvement that'll come in this week? Where do you see a? It has to come and be where it will come. Overall, well, I, I think against Saskatchewan going into their home field, and you know, there that's a tough field to play in. Very uh, for anybody, but I think if they come out offensively the same way they did in the first quarter here, they'll silence that crowd for a period of time. Now I see the improvement coming from the defensive side. I really think the defense understands what Harris is doing. You know, it's one, two balls out. He's not going to hold that football back there. And if he does hold it, it's going to be a sack. So what do you do? You disrupt the receivers. You take them off their initial route. Make him reset. When he resets, then I think the defensive line can get there. That's a great point. And maybe I can end by making an observation on that. I mean, they had four sacks. I mean, there were the three that talked about from, you know, in the in basically in, in the pocket between the between the hashes. But there was the one outside uh, where Trevor, you know, was forced to go and hang on and hang on. But and I would call, that was a coverage sack. I mean, he he created a lot of time to run that. So that time they were on there. They were they actually were tight to their receivers. It was a fantastic coverage sack. And, that, and that's what we're looking for. That's the improvement I think we'll see in as much as the defense is now starting to play together. Uh, and the secondary is starting to communicate better uh, on their side of the ball. Okay. Well, let's leave it at that. Sal, next week, same time, same place. Hey, I love it. Thank you, everybody, for spending your time with us on this daily podcast. Please join us a couple of times tomorrow on Cats Audio Network for Cats This Week first, and also our Wednesday episode of this podcast as the Cats hold their first rec- practice of the week in preparation for Sunday's return match with the Rough Riders. This has been Tie Cats Today, and I'm Steve Milton. This has been Tie Cats Today with Steve Milton. Catch it on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts.